But the British royals, with rare exception, don't produce any creative value for society. They simply married or were born into a bloodline. Both their fame and their position within British society is strictly a byproduct of their birth. And as Harry describes in Spare, I've heard, I haven't read it, and won't be doing so, even that is so heavily dependent on birth order that outside of the eldest son in a given family, many of the members are considered to some extent disposable. And it's particularly ironic that American conservatives, who are all about glorifying the founding fathers who broke away from the crown, are statistically much more into the monarchy than their liberal counterparts. But if you think about it, the overall conservative value placed on concepts of hierarchy and nobility definitely tracks with a royalist mindset. Hey guys, it's Chelsea from The Financial Diet. And it's the most wonderful time of the year. That's right, July. That holiday month we all know and love. And today is a holiday, the 4th of July, and also in many ways, its own social media-based holiday, and that is entering peak travel porn season. The season of asking, how did this person I follow on social media manage to afford this three-week European vacation? Um, if I'm one of those people you follow on social media, I'm happy to answer you. Uh, I'm in a dual-income, no-kid household, uh, and we prioritize travel. But for a lot of people, the travel remains both a mystery and sometimes a bit of a source of frustration. And very recently, The New Yorker published a rather insufferable article called The Case Against Travel. It's, in my opinion, a bit of a cynical indictment of a certain type of travel, and seems to be written from a pretty elitist perspective. I heard tell on social media that the person who wrote this article actually like traveled to like dozens of countries before the age of 10, but let's set that aside. All of this is to say, in the heat of summer, travel is on our minds and on our social media feeds, and the way travel has become more than ever a consumer and media product has made travel porn basically unavoidable for most of us, and has profoundly impacted how we think about travel as a concept. Social media in general, and TikTok and Instagram in particular, coupled with a post-pandemic boom in travel, have created perfect conditions for over-tourism. So let's dive into why this is bad, and how consumerism is, as you might have guessed on TFD, the real culprit here. So let's start with social media travel porn and the problem of the bucket list. So the concept of bucket list travel turns something that is supposed to be a leisurely activity into a competition. And this is only exacerbated by algorithmically favored TikToks with titles like five underrated cities in Europe or four bucket list hotels in Bali. A lot of this content, as well as photos or reels on Instagram, fall under what has been called travel porn, aspirational and idealistic images that are often curated to ignore the reality of visiting a place, even at times oversaturating the colors and exaggerating the perspective to make whatever's being depicted appear otherworldly. Because the popularity of this type of content can increase individuals' feelings of FOMO when it comes to travel, it means more and more of us end up going to the same places, eventually breeding over-tourism and leading to more Instagram versus reality posts showcasing just how much of a fantasy many of these travel porn posts really are, especially when it comes to circumnavigating huge crowds to get the perfect shot. This is um, a personal anecdote, but I uh, went to the Amalfi Coast and Naples for the first time a couple years ago, and by far my favorite part of that experience was Naples itself. I highly recommend Naples, love it, have great recommendations for it if you're in the market, and by far my least favorite place that I went on that trip, and also I think maybe ever in my life was Positano, um, which like, I don't know if you, if you guys have been to Positano and you had a positive experience, Sorry, uh, cover your ears, but I just remember so vividly, and granted, to be fair, I was there in August. I wouldn't have chosen to go there in August, but it was like we had to schedule it with some other things. But I just remember walking up like the windy streets, and it was so clogged with tourists that you could barely move. Like you could literally almost not diverge more than like six centimeters either direction from your path because you would step on someone. And every single store was just selling a bunch of like cheap manufactured like lemon and the only places to go were like literally hotels full of billionaires. And obviously I didn't get to go to those hotels, but they looked really nice from the outside. Um, Suffice to say, I'm sure Positano was nice at a time. I'm sure maybe if you go there in like the dead of winter, you can catch a vibe, but Positano in summer is atrocious. 
Now, of course, when our expectations of anything are really high, there's going to be an inevitable disappointment with the reality of it. And that is part of what makes social media-driven travel so toxic, because not only are we being sold a, to some extent, artificial image, we're also being sold someone else's dream, someone else's experience. And how can we decouple what we really want from what we're just being told by the right people is what we should desire. And in some ways, this is what that aforementioned New Yorker article was getting at. By placing so much importance on travel, we turn it into something to aspire to. Being well-traveled is seen as a virtue, causing us to feel like we're missing out on something if we don't participate in the right way. I also have to shout out my article I wrote on the subject seven years ago. But back to that New Yorker article, as the writer puts it, travel is fun, so it's not mysterious that we like it. What is mysterious is why we imbue it with a vast significance, an aura of virtue. A vacation is merely the pursuit of unchanging change, an embrace of nothing. So why insist on its meaning? Now, this has a lot of really classist connotations, which I will get to in a bit. But I do agree that when we look at travel as something morally virtuous, we are also just ignoring its realities which in my perspective have a lot less to do with the individual traveler and a lot more to do with the impact that certain types of travel can have on communities, rental markets, and the economic, cultural, and political contexts of the places that are being touristed. So let's start by establishing the big fact, which is that travel is a privilege. So one of the big issues that the New Yorker article largely fails to take into account is that travel is in and of itself a luxury product especially international travel. Only about a third of Americans even have a passport to begin with. And for many people, travel has an enormous amount of meaning, even if it is just a vacation, because for many people, this is the type of financial goal they'll be working to for years, if not decades. For example, a trip to Italy you've been saving up for a lifetime for is a very different conversation than your fifth trip to Italy to make sure that you've ticked off all the boxes you feel like you should see. According to 2021 data from the Pew Research Center, almost half of those earning less than $30,000 a year have not left the country, compared with 28% of those who earn between 30 and 79,999 a year, and 10% of those earning $80,000 or more. These highest earners are also significantly more likely to have visited multiple countries. And this divide exists across many axes of privilege according to Pew's data. Men are more likely to have traveled out of the country than women, those with the higher education are more likely to have traveled abroad than those without, and white Americans are more likely to have traveled abroad than black Americans. And keep in mind that this is just data from the US, already one of the wealthiest countries in the world. The vast majority of people globally are not able to check off any kind of travel bucket list. So when we talk about travel at its most broad, both in and out of the social media context, and regardless of any kind of moral virtue someone might ascribe to it, we must remind ourselves that we are talking about a very small, privileged class of society to begin with. Which becomes even more frustrating when you consider just how negative many of the effects of over-tourism can be on the people who can least afford to deal with it on the back end. So we can't ignore that much of tourism is, in its way, a new form of colonialism. For years now, wealthy and often white people from Western countries have treated places like Southeast Asia as their personal playground for finding themselves, which we can sort of shorthand as the eat, pray, love effect. From one 2019 article from The Atlantic, Social media are at work too, with apps such as Instagram leading tourists to pitch over cliffs and clog vital roadways in search of the perfect pick, and sites such as Yelp and TripAdvisor making restaurants, museums, and beaches discoverable and thus ruinable. Overtourism itself is a media phenomenon as much as it is anything else. The word catapulted into common use in 2017, with wall-to-wall -wall coverage of the problems in Venice, Bali, and elsewhere helping to drive the global backlash against tourists, as well as the backlash to the backlash. And even a lot of those Instagram versus reality memes, which at least somewhat attempt to remove the sheen of social media-driven travel porn, can often themselves convey a sense of entitlement. Take this example of a person's trip to the Maldives. They were expecting serene ocean views and romantic, crowdless beachfront dinners. Then the reality shows debris from storms, images of piles of garbage, and the exterior of a prison. Which only plays into the colonialist notion that less developed countries should cater to what wealthy tourists desire to see. The reality of the Maldives is an affront to this tourist's expectations and therefore must be mocked. And the irony is, for many tourist destinations, the unpleasant realities are often a direct result of tourism in the first place, following the path laid out by long-term results of colonialism. Using the Maldives as an example, here's an excerpt from an article in Euro News. The Maldives is a tropical paradise of immaculate white beaches and spectacular coral reefs. 
but it might be gone by the end of the century. That's the verdict of the country's Minister of Environment, Aminath Shauna, who says that unless urgent action is taken to curb the climate crisis, the Indian Ocean archipelago of more than 1,000 islands could be underwater by the year 2100. Climate change is real, and we are the most vulnerable country in the world, says Shauna. There's no higher ground for us. It's just us, our islands, and the sea. The nation stands at an average height of just one meter above sea level, making both increased groundswell and unpredictable weather patterns an imminent threat to life on the coral atolls. While the very survival of the Maldives remains dependent upon limiting the impacts of climate change, the majority of the country's 540,000 citizens rely on tourism as their main source of income. The travel industry produces around 8% of annual CO2 emissions globally, a figure which is expected to rise by 4% every single year. Now, all of this can seem like a bit of a bummer, especially, again, in a social media landscape that is algorithmically driven to make us want to go places we've never heard of and then be inevitably disappointed by the reality of it. And it's totally natural for people to want to continue to travel. Outside of any moral implications, there are also a lot of wonderful benefits of travel, and it's fun as hell. But are there better ways to travel? For all its negatives, TikTok does make space for something that's not quite as prevalent on Instagram, conversations about the negative impacts of tourism. According to a National Geographic article, on most social platforms, travel problems such as over-tourism can get glossed over. On TikTok, they get called out. One reason for this is that the platform's audience is generally younger and more socially engaged than on other platforms, according to June Park, a senior cultural strategist at Sparks & Honey, a cultural consultancy firm. They are concerned about ethical consumerism and travel. TikTok is going to drive responsible tourism, especially in light of a pandemic. And this isn't to say that you can't also find tons of exploitative travel content and advice on TikTok, but that you can also follow along with conversations about places that you're considering visiting, especially conversations involving actual locals. And it can also be a good resource for finding sustainable alternatives. For instance, search the hashtag slow travel. And yes, you will find insufferable romanticizations of nomad life, but you will also find tons of arguments for staying in one place for an extended period of time rather than plane hopping to a bunch of countries, which is in and of itself a more sustainable way to travel. And we can also be more cognizant about where we're traveling, as much for our own experience as for its impacts on the place we're visiting. I frankly regret having gone to Positano and would advise other people to not go there if they can avoid it. There are tons of other amazing places to go in Italy where the experience is likely to be much more authentic, much more delicious, much more affordable, and also not making it impossible for people who actually live in those areas to have anything resembling a normal local community. I'm someone who, for example, spends a lot of every year in France, and although I do spend a fair amount of that in Paris, a city which, comparable to New York, has both an authentic city life full of locals as well as a lot of tourism, I do also spend a lot of time with family in remote areas that get almost no international tourism. And places like that are where I will often recommend my friends who are considering going to France to visit. Not just because they could use a few tourism bucks their way, but also because, to me, it's a much more authentic representation of what the country of France actually is. We can also do things like avoiding all-inclusive resorts that tend to destroy local economies and ecologies, not fall prey to the predatory timeshare industries to protect our finances, and I'll link you guys in the description to a recent Too Good To Be True episode that dove into that subject specifically. And at the very least, we can all shame the ultra-rich for not only propagating a lot of this tourism porn, but doing it via their climate-destroying private jets. And now it's time for our society member questions of the video. As a reminder, one of the many, many perks of being a society member at TFD, which you can become by hitting the join button or joining over at our Patreon linked in the description, is asking me my members only questions of the day. I answer two per video and the next one could be yours. Today's first question is, as an entrepreneur with a growing clientele, I'm struggling to keep up with friends and clients who insist on messaging me directly for discounts, even when a manager handles this better on my behalf. How do you manage the stress from this? And what's a good strategy to steer them toward the manager without sounding dismissive? 
To me, as an entrepreneur, the question is simple. To what extent do you really need their business? If you're at a point in your business where every client is really, really valuable and you need all of the ones you can get, then I think it's probably still the time when you need to be handling a bit more of this personally um, because although it can be annoying, having a clientele base amongst your friends and family can also be really, really beneficial um, and it's important to keep them happy on some level. Um, if you're at a point where you no longer need their business and you can afford to be a bit more removed, I think it's totally fair and within your rights to say, hey, there's actually someone that handles that. Um, I don't even really work on that stuff right now and I feel like I wouldn't be able to do a good job um, and to pass them along. But when I was first starting out as an entrepreneur, trust me that I was like in there giving hugs and kisses to everyone that came through my door to get a little bit of business. Um, and now I'm, I'm definitely much more good about outsourcing a lot of that. But for example, I am very much on the hustle selling the out of my novel and I am in my DMs 50,000 times a day responding to any and everyone being like, thank you for reading. Here's how to get a copy. Like here's how to order it in your life. Like I am, I am my own customer service rep. I am my marketing specialist. I am my uh, events plan. I am everything. So I am mom uh, when it comes to this part of uh, the, the business. So it all depends on where you are. The next question is, I'm 22 and planning my first trip to Europe after I graduate with my MA next year. Do you have any tips for planning and budgeting? Um, yes, so planning, definitely everything we described in today's video um, in terms of where to go and where not to go. Um, generally, the less touristy an area is, the better experience you'll have in a lot of ways and the more affordable it will be generally. Um, some good tips for planning um, are definitely, I love to use Google Sheets to plan out my itinerary as well as my packing. When I have like a big trip that's, you know, that I've really been looking forward to and has a lot of moving parts, I'll have an Excel sheet that has a few different tabs. Um, one with my packing, one with like logistic info, one with like day-to-day -day plans. That's just how I like to do it. Um, definitely have a few plans that are more structured in nature. Like maybe you'll take a class or you'll rent bikes and go on a bike tour. You'll go on a walking tour. You'll visit a specific museum. Like try to have tent poles, but also leave time to really enjoy yourself in between and, you know, really embrace the spontaneity that travel um, can be so lovely for. Uh, then in terms of budgeting, I would highly recommend A, um, having a single fund as early on as possible uh, that you're just siphoning money into all the time that is specifically for this travel. In general, I recommend budgeting at least 20% more than you think you need, like having a buffer of that amount in your uh, dedicated travel savings uh, so that you're not having to unexpectedly dip into emergency fund when things come up, um, which they often can during travel. Travel can frequently end up more expensive than you think it will be. Um, in terms of saving money while there, I am a huge, huge fan of things like picnics. One advantage of uh, doing an Airbnb over a hotel is that you can cook. Um, and I love in you know countries I'm visiting to go to the market, getting fresh products and either taking them to have on a picnic um, or making something at home. Um, so those are definitely some of my recommendations. Also, if you're in a major city, there are usually so many free or super cheap activities going on at any given time. Um, just remember that travel does not have to be synonymous with uh, luxury. As always guys, thank you for watching and don't forget to hit the subscribe button and to come back every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday for new and awesome videos. Bye-bye.